Hello and welcome to Red Tree Church's online service. We just wanted to say thank you so much for listening in today. And no matter where you are tuning in from, we love to stay connected with our online community, whether that's through our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, our Church Center app, or of course our podcast. And whether this is your first time listening or your hundredth time listening, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by today's message. So let's take a listen. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning, Red Tree? Good, good, good. Hey, we are excited that you're here. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for being here. If you are a returning guest, we are so glad that you're here as well. Uh, Red Tree exists so that we can continue to reach into our community. Uh, years ago, that was our desire, was to reach people who are far from God, who are deconstructing their faith, maybe walking away from faith, confused by faith. Um, if I've said anything already that may be landing with you or you've ever been there, would you just raise your hand up real quick? Anyone ever had difficulties in your faith and knowing what it really is? Yeah, I think all of us have been in that spot eventually. Uh, if you haven't been there, hang on, all right? It's coming. Because sometimes the world just hits us and it's like, now nah, I, I don't agree with that. Like, I don't understand how that could happen if I'm following Jesus. I thought I was doing really good. I thought I was doing really well. And it seems like this is really shaking me up. And so we're be beginning this new series called The Fundamental List. You see what I did it? Not The Fundamentalist, right? But The Fundamental List. It's like, what matters most? Uh, growing up, I've been having the opportunity to, to coach my boys in baseball. And so I, I love that. And it seems like, all right, when you guys are this tall, of course, we're mathesists, so we don't get real tall, all right? But when you boys are this tall, we're going to teach you the fundamentals of baseball. How do you swing a bat? How do you stand in a box? How do you position your body when you're fielding the ball? How do you hold your arm up? How do you release? All the different things of fundamental ball. Well, my son is now going, my youngest boy is going to seventh grade. Guess what we still do at practice? We work on the fundamentals. You know why? Because that's what matters. Guess what the professionals do? They work on the fundamentals. I love to watch professional grown men who are doing the things that the young guys want to do. And they're doing T work over and over and over again. And it's like, are you kidding me, right? Or in any sports, you get this. You understand it. Fundamentals matter. If you do not do those correct, eventually somebody will find a way and you will no longer win, right? And so, and that's what we want. In the, we want the W, baby. We want the W. And so sometimes you get one, sometimes you don't. But that's all right. That's called learning opportunities, okay? Learning opportunities. Hey, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. Go ahead and get that. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 13. But before we get there, I want to share one of the things in my life that happened when I was a young man. I was a junior in high school. I grew up in church my whole life. A great church. Uh, man, the pastor preached hard. Uh, people were getting saved. Things were, it was a great, in the middle of nowhere, Salem, Missouri. Anybody familiar with Salem, Missouri? Either you went floating on the current or you were going to go do meth. And so, either way, I'm glad you're here. All right, I'm glad we are so, no perfect people allowed. This is why we started Red Tree. Amen, right? And so, uh, if you know where Salem is, those are usually the options. If you go 30 minutes past Salem, there's a huge town of at least 43 people called Boss, Missouri. This is where my grandparents lived. They had a huge farm. Uh, where they had Angus cattle. It was awesome. I get to ride full withers, right? We didn't ride horses anymore because God created full withers. Amen. And so we rode full withers. It was great. I accepted the Lord at the age of nine in a little bitty church out there. But when I turned 16, I, I began to wrestle with some things of faith. I began to have questions. <clears throat> and unfortunately, I learned you don't question your pastor. All right? You, you, you don't do that. What he says from stage is the word of God. Duh. Right? When you say it that way, it's even more authoritative, right? And so I thought, well, that's, that's crazy, man. Because the thing I began to learn was a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. All right, if, if you can't test the faith, then you're not going to be able to trust the faith when opportunities come your way, right? And you need to know that you are solid in your faith. And if you can't test that, and if I can't even ask a question about some clarity, then maybe this ain't what I want to do. But... I accepted Christ at the age of nine and wrestled with some things. We started a band in a youth group. It was awesome. I was the drummer, right? I was drummer. I played hard. It was great. I played heavy metal. It was awesome, right? I mean, we're singing How Great Thou Art. We're like double kick. 
and the ladies, and the, they're loving it. They're loving it, right? And so it was, it was what we did, but my dad was the worship pastor. He'd be like, hey, son, maybe you ought to like leave that double kick out. I don't know how great thou art. I'm like, but dad, you got to feel that. You got to feel that. He's like, well, we felt it all right. And you keep it up, you're going to feel it, right? I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I cut that down. Well, we started a worship team in the youth group. We had a, a building over of the side of the building that we were in. And there was a Sunday night that everything fell apart for me. Because, I mean, our, our, our youth worship team, like, we wasn't any good, but, man, we thought we were. Right? I mean, we were playing AC. No, not we play AC, DC. We played <laughs> audio adrenaline stuff. We played DC talk stuff. You, you, you all know what those are? And listen, if you have the Audio A Bloom album, huh, you're lucky. That's the best album ever released right there. Bloom is it. Go look it up. Students, go check out Audio Adrenaline, all right? Not the first band I mentioned. Anyway, the pastor is preaching. He stood up, and he, he did one of these where you, like, you pound your fist. Like, ah! That's where everyone knows, like, man, he means it. He means it. He stepped out of the edge over the, the auditorium there, and he points it. And I'm going to tell you one more thing. And we're like, yeah, man, come on, get it, get it. He says, that crap over there has got to stop. And I thought, hey, exactly, exactly, right? I'm like, what? That's, that's what I do. Like, that's what I do. Like, I love that crap over there. Like, and it's good music. Third day, audio adrenaline, all these guys, like, you know, like that. What do you mean? That's great stuff. I'm a drummer, man. Let, let, me, let me drum. And being in a small town, you get your friends, that they form a band, they're like, dude, you want to go play in the honky-tonk? I'm like, yeah, I do. And my dad's like, I will kill you. I'm like, all right, I guess I won't go, dad. I guess I won't go. But then when this happened, I'm like, well, I can't, I can't play in the church either. Man, I got up out of my seat, out of the pew, and I walked straight to the back. And, and everyone else is like watching me like, like that's the worship pastor's kid. Like, he, he can't be doing that. Mark, you need to get your son in line. Lisa, you need to get in. Listen, if you tell my mom something like that, she just knocked you out right there where you are, right? You don't mess with them country women. Amen? Some of y'all married to them, and you slow learners, all right? You better get it figured out. But that, that crushed me. It broke me. Because honestly, if we have a student that wants to be involved in the church, don't you think we ought to create a space that a student could be involved in the church? Don't you think that the church should be responsible for creating atmospheres and environments that students want to be in? Come on now, don't start backing up on me. Don't start backing up on me because here's the deal. Here's the deal. It takes work to make that happen, right? You do not naturally drift that way. You have to be intentional to stay going in that direction. Amen? And when we begin to tell students, hey, we, it makes us feel awkward when you do that. We don't really like that. You better know that it's in the Bible that they ain't supposed to be doing that. Amen? Or an issue may be with you. <laughs> That's about as quiet as it was the first service. Everyone likes it until it becomes personal. Now, some of you, your story is different. Some of you, you got pregnant outside of wedlock, and the church came down on you really hard, right? Because they could see that taking place, and they begin to condemn you and shame you and judge you and tell you you can't be in the youth group choir anymore, and you don't get to go on the youth group trip. And as, if, as if you don't have enough stuff going on, now the church is coming down on you. And they're telling you, you don't belong here. You don't fit here. You have sinned, and we can all see it. What about your pastor's wife? Not you, babe, but the other pastor's wife, yeah? You know what I'm talking about? What about, what about her that keeps gossiping and keeps telling people all these other things? You going to shut her down? No, you ain't going to shut her down. What about you, man? You look like you ain't protecting God's temple very well these days. Should we shut you down? Well, no, we ain't going to shut you down. What about, and, and see, you see what we do? These, what we begin to call, these are, these are fundamentals, they're not fundamentals. They're not scripturally correct. It's what we have become comfortable with. And that is now what we begin to enforce upon other people. You know who did that in the Bible? Pharisees. Pharisees are the ones that did that in the Bible. They would take a truth and they would raise it so high that nobody would be able to reach his standard. But they would be able to condemn you and judge you as they ever seen fit. Because why? They're the religious people. That is not so when you follow Jesus. I need you to know that. I, I, I need you to hear me say that is not the way we operate at Red Tree Church. I need you to understand that. It matters to us who it is and what it is that you're pursuing. And what we believe at Red Tree is that we are all a bunch of jacked up individuals pursuing a holy God. Amen? 
And so if you can fit that category, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, because some of your stories is, are, are the reason that you feel like you can't really fully trust Jesus anymore. Some of your stories are the reason you feel like you can't go to a, a religious organized group anymore. If it looks like Jesus, if it smells like Jesus, if it looks like the church, you don't want anything to do with the church. You love Jesus, but you just don't love the church anymore, right? I know students that have dealt with some serious difficulties in their family, in their lives. Some of them have lost friends early. And it causes a disrupt in what they begin to believe. And if the church is not the place that they can come and ask hard questions, I promise you Satan will provide a place where they can. And when they are not receiving biblical advice, listen, Red Tree, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. When their students are trying to figure out what God's doing inside of them, what they're wading through, what they're trying to figure out on their own, there should be a place that Pastor Garrett continues to create for our student ministry, where anybody's welcome to come up in here. It's the same for the church. We want to create that space for you. This is a conversation that takes place with Jesus. Because Jesus has been doing ministry. People are starting to talk about him. They're starting to chirp up and say things. And so Jesus has his disciples with him, as he usually did. And he asked them this question. Now, I want to be cautious to, to warn you. I don't know if you should ask this question or not. Because you may get an answer you're not ready for. But Jesus asked him this in chapter 16. Starting in verse 13, it says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you for what you've already done this morning. Lord, for the way we continue to be a part of what it is that you do, God. I pray that the worship would continue to move forward. If there's someone here and they are not a Christ follower, Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself as only you can do. Lord, if there are Christ followers here that are struggling in their faith, Lord, maybe there's been something that has distracted them. Maybe there's been something that has derailed and has caused complications within their faith. Lord, I pray that maybe today they would take one more step closer back into that relationship. God, that you would wrap your arms around them and love on them well. And that they would know that you see them and that you love them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I love when Jesus does these things because, you know, when Jesus asked a question, the disciples were like, uh-oh, are we in trouble, right? It, it, it's kind of like as a kid growing up and your dad be like, hey, you boys know who broke that, that uh, window out there in the shed? And you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. What do you mean? What, what, what do you mean? When Jesus asked him, hey, guys, real quick, I want to ask you a question. Who do people say that I am? The son of man is? Who do they say the son of man is? And so they reply. They say this. They replied, some say John the Baptist, which is the reason that they're in this area. John the Baptist was thrown in prison, and Jesus came to town. He was visiting. John the Baptist actually sent some of his followers to go to Jesus and say, hey, are you the one that we were expecting to come or not? Because I'm your cousin. I'm thrown in prison. I got thrown in prison for standing up for truth and for morals and what's right. And I'm getting ready to get my head chopped off. So if you love your boy, come and see me, right? Help me out here a little bit. And so they, they, Jesus says, hey, listen, I want you to go back and tell John that there's many signs being performed. There's miracles taking place. And God is on the move. Like, for real? You're not going to come and see him? Go let him know. And John gets his head cut off, right? Now, that is a messed up family, isn't it? Right there. Like, bro, you just let your cousin get his head cut off. Some of y'all got that cousin. You're like, ah, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. It's just a joke. Let, let's continue on before I get myself in trouble. <clears throat> uh, others say Elijah and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Basically, they're saying, Jesus, there's a lot of people talking. And what they think has happened is you've, re you've been reincarnated. Like you, you are somebody through the, you right now. And Jesus is like, man, I, I, I don't, okay, that's, that's cute. H have you ever known people that will fill in the gaps and they don't know all the information, but they just go ahead and go with it anyway? And then all of a sudden they begin to believe it's true and it changes everything. So Jesus is like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to pause that conversation. In verse uh, 15, it says this, watch what Jesus asked him, but what about you? Which that's the question I would ask you. Who do you say Jesus is? Because Jesus has been titled and known as many things. 
a great leader, a great teacher, a prophet, someone who would go and do great things, a, a healer, miracle performer. Jesus is known as many different things. But he asked them, who do you say that I am? And they're like, man, Lord, we've been traveling with you now for at least 15 chapters. <laughs> Come on now, y'all. That's funnier than that. Come on now. Uh, it's been longer than that. It's like, hey, listen, man, we, we have left things and we have decided to follow you. Like, we, why, why would you ask us, who do, you, who do we say you are? He asked, who do you say that I am? And here's the one that speaks up. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now I want to pause. And I want to ask you this question. What if that's true? Like, what if that is true? Like, what if Simon Peter was able to answer that question properly, but was able to identify for the first time, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. What if that is true? Now, what does that mean for you if it is true? For me personally, I do believe it is true. For me personally, I do believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe all of those things. I believe that is true. I believe we have authority to believe that's true. I believe we've had many men and women give their lives so that the message would continue to move forward. I believe that is true. But what about you? What does that change now if it is true? It changes everything. If this is true, it changes everything. Because if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is the one that we waited for, if Jesus is that person, basically, Neon Dion would say it this way. He is he, man, right? I mean, he is he. That's the one right there, right now. He is Jesus, the Messiah. Well, man, it, it, that, that changes how we respond to him. That changes how we worship him. That changes how we honor him. That changes how we glorify him. That changes how I live today. That changes how I live tomorrow. Because if this is true, it changes everything. Do you live that way? Do I live that way? Did Peter live that way? See, what happens is we all get a God box, right? Everybody put your arms up like this right here. Everybody's right here. Some of y'all got a bigger God box than mine. That's great, all right? We all have a God box. And whether you believe it or not, you have what's a God box. And, and listen, you tried to decide what gets to fit in here, okay? All right, now, all y'all put your box down. It got weird real quick. All right. You get to decide what goes in this box. A lot of you have put things in that box that is called embedded theology. Now, some of you are like, dude, don't, don't nerd out on me right now, Okay. I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying. Don't start nerding out. Embedded theology is the things that you believe that you didn't even know you were beginning to believe, but is the things that you're being taught, right? It is, it is what you grew up as your childhood. And for some of you, you're like, man, I'm working on kicking those things. That is called deconstructing your faith. Because you were taught these are the fundamentals of following Jesus, and all of a sudden you decided I don't know if it is. And when you were questioned about it or you questioned it, they just told you then you're not a Christ follower. You're like, wait, now back up. What do you mean I'm not a Christ follower? Just because I ask a question about this? Again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but this is where some of you are right now. You have questions and you feel it's not safe, man. It is not safe. I love Jesus, but I'm just not sure about the church, which is a shame. Because the church was Jesus' idea. It is his idea. And it will be his idea. Church, we got to get better. Amen? So I grew up with a God box. And my God box was this. This is how naive and crazy I was. I'm sure you're not there. If I do good, God will do what I want him to do. Right? 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 Yeah, 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 I can do that. All right. If I do, if I perform well, then God will take care. He will do my bidding for me, right? He will lead and guide me through the things that I need. That was in my God box. Guess what happened when it didn't happen? What? God, where you at in there? Right? 
Here's what's interesting about your God box. The more you get to know who Jesus is, boy, the bigger that box gets, isn't it? I mean, the bigger that box gets. Now, hear, hear me this. Hear me on this. The truth in the box, it never changes. Amen? I don't care what year it is. I don't care what town you live in. I don't care what the issue is. The truth is still the truth. Amen? And there's times I just don't like the truth. Anybody else with me on that one? Yeah, okay. The rest of y'all lying. All right. The rest of y'all lying. There are times that the truth hits and you're just like, oh, man, I really wish I could. And he's like, no, no, man, that ain't. If, if you're following me, you're going to live this way. If you're following me, you submit and surrender to what I want for you. I'll be honest with you. There's no better way to go. There is no better way to go than to follow Jesus and to submit and to surrender to him. Now, is there going to be bumps along the way? Absolutely. But for some of you, your fundamentals that you were taught that's in your box, they don't allow for that to happen. You ain't going to be able to question it. And also there's a strong shame game. There's a great guilt punch, right? All these different things. If you grew up in that atmosphere, if you grew up in that environment, you're struggling with what may be fundamentally correct and what may not be fundamentally correct. We're seeing people of all ages walk away from faith greater than we ever have before. And the reason people are walking away from faith isn't because they don't believe Jesus. The reason people are walking away from faith, listen to this, is because they know that, or they, they think that you don't believe what you believe about Jesus. So they're like, if, if the church isn't going to believe Jesus, then why in the world should I go to the church? And why in the world would that faith be for me? Can you blame them? Can, can you blame them? And so people are beginning to walk away from, I mean, pastors that are beginning to denounce their faith and say, this has all been what it is. You see, that's not following Jesus. That is trying to get him to do what you want him to do. And when he doesn't do it, everything gets messed up. And so you have a God box. The disciples had a God box. And when Jesus went to the cross to be crucified, it was not big enough for that to happen. Their God box could not handle the Messiah being killed. Their God box could not handle Jesus being crucified. Because if you're the Messiah, if you're the Savior, you're not going to die. And all of them picked up their box and they moved. They traveled. They got away from it. And they began to question, we wasted so much time following Jesus. We thought we were building our kingdom. And Jesus is dead. If you've been here before, you've heard me say before, there was nobody standing outside the tomb on the third day going, 10, 9, 8. There not, no, nobody believed. Nobody believed. Because their God box had been destroyed. But you know what? They re-engaged better and stronger than they ever did when Jesus raised from the dead. And you know what old Pete did? Pete said, Lord, I am so sorry I have messed up. I've sinned against you. I can no longer be worthy to be called one of your children. And Jesus like, Pete, stop, 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 stop. This is your problem, Pete. You always run in your mouth. Anybody else be able to identify with that? Huh? Come on now. Listen, listen. You can raise your hand for your spouse if you want to. That's okay. Right? There you go again, run in your mouth. You shouldn't have done that. But anyway, right? And so Peter's like, I'm so disqualified. I messed up. And Jesus says, Peter, stop. I want to ask you a question, Peter. Do you love me? And Pete goes, yeah, absolutely. I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. And, and, and you know all of this starts to run through Peter's mind. Like, man, I was the one to say, you're the Messiah. Like, I was the one to say, I will never leave you. Like, I'll, all these other disciples may desert you, but not me. I'm here. I'm in for the win, man. And Jesus looked at Peter again. He said, Pete, do you love me? And Peter just looks back at Jesus. And I imagine he probably kind of hung his head down. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know all things. You know, I, I got to... Jesus, I'm trying so hard. Jesus, I, I am so sorry. Like, I, I wish I could go back and do it all over again. Jesus, I'm sorry I, I cursed you. When you walked through there, I know you've seen me, and 
they were questioning me by the bonfire there, and I got so nervous and so scared. I was afraid if I tell them I was with you, they're going to they're gonna crucify me also. And I know I messed up. I shouldn't have done that, and I sinned. Jesus looks at Pete, he's like, Pete, here's what I want you to do, man. Like, yeah, anything, anything. Go feed my sheep. He's like, say what? Go feed my sheep. I'm the good shepherd, all right? You guys are the sheep. Pete, I need you to go feed the sheep. Pete, I need you to go look for people who are disconnected. Pete, I need you to go find people who just like you at one time are so far from me. Pete, I need you to go and I need you to reach into the lives of the students that believe this is a hoax. Pete, I need you to go and do only what I can do. But Peter, guess what? I'm going to do it through you. Now, let me read it to you now because it may sound a little different. Verse 15 says this, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now watch this. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying, Pete, I, this church is going to be built on you, man. You're the guy. And Peter at that moment thought, yes, I am. I'm going to do it, Lord. Wow, we're going to go see people get saved, man. We're going to reach this a town full of addicts. We're going to show them who Jesus is. We're going to help the people who are struggling. We're going to show them who Jesus is. And then you know what happened? Peter's God box couldn't hold all the stuff going on. Peter's God box couldn't hold that Jesus was being crucified. Peter's God box seemed like it was just imploding on itself. But God already told him, no, no, no. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter, you're that rock, my man. Pete, do you love me? I love you, Lord. I want you to go feed my sheep. I want you to go reach people. Matter of fact, I want you to take the keys of the kingdom. And whoever you win, whoever you let in, they will be forever in. You're going to have the opportunity to share Jesus, to share me with everybody. I don't know where you are with faith this morning. But I know for some of you, there's been a church experience. And it revolved around some fundamentals. And you at one point thought, I, I, I didn't even know that was in the fundamentals. Or maybe you're learning was not one of the fundamentals and the church hurt me you see some of you know people who have said I will never go back into church I will never step another foot inside a church building some of those, those are your parents that's your mom and it's your dad for some of you it's your children I'm not going to church anymore I'm not doing that and if a church is the reason that they feel that way I want you to know that I'm sorry. It may not have been Red Tree, but I want you to know that I'm sorry that they feel that way. And we will do whatever we can to reach people with the gospel. One of the things we say around here, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people with the gospel. We believe that's serious about it. We want to see people come to know who Jesus is. Not this made up version, not a denominational Jesus, not a Jesus that only fits inside certain box, but a Jesus of the New Testament. That is the Jesus that we will continue to preach. That is the, that is the Jesus that we will continue to sing about. And that is the Jesus that we will continue to point people toward. I want everybody just to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to give you an opportunity to respond back. I know for some of you, like a message like this is pretty heavy. Because it brings up that really bad experience. And now you're second guessing, like, I, I, I knew I shouldn't have came. I gotta go through all this again. Listen, you, you are not created to carry that alone. Like, you, you need people to be able to walk with you. You need to be able to unload that hurt, that pain, maybe some of that guilt, the shame that's been put on you. Don't carry that around. Take it and lay it at the foot of the cross. 
Jesus said he didn't come to condemn you. He come to give you new life. Don't you dare let somebody else continue to condemn you when God is trying to give you a new life. Take those worries, take those hurts, take those pains and lay them at the foot of the cross. Some of you may be here this morning, you're not a Christ follower. And I'm sure if we sat down and we talked about it, I would understand why you feel the way that you feel and what you believe But I need you to know that the Jesus of the New Testament loves you the way that you are. Right now, in this moment, he loves you the way that you are. Like, if if you're thinking, man, I I, I really need to begin to think about this. Listen, you, you can't get yourself good enough to be able to stand in the presence of Jesus. Like, you cannot go home and clean yourself up enough to earn his righteousness. That is not how it works. It is a gift. It is unmerited favor being offered. It is grace being offered to all of us. Me, I responded at the age of nine. And I said, Jesus, I want you to become my Lord and my Savior and forgive me of my sins. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to do that. Because you thought, well, man, I thought I was good with God, but I've never done anything like that. If you're here this morning, you want to begin to follow Jesus. I want you to be able to say this out loud or say it in your head. Whatever it is you want to do, but say something like this if you are ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. Dear Jesus, I need you. I need you to come into my life. Forgive me of all of my sins and make me yours. You know my doubts, you know my fears. You know my failures, but today I begin to follow you. Help me from this day forward. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you said that prayer this morning and now you are following Jesus, would you do me a favor, would you just slip your hand up real quick and say, hey, you know what, Jesus is now my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Anybody at all, just put it up, put it back down. Amen. Thank you. You put it down. Anybody else? Just put it up, put it back down. Anybody else? Maybe you're here this morning and you know you're a Christ follower, but just like you heard about Pete, boy, he got himself in a bad spot. There were things that happened that did not fit inside that box that he had created. And he wasn't really sure how to respond to it. So he just, he went the different direction. Maybe you're here this morning and that's you. You know you're not following Jesus like he's leading you. But today you know I have got to get to where I need to be to follow Jesus well. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just do me a favor? Would you just slip your hand up real quick so we can pray for you? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it down. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Thank you. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, what a privilege and an honor it is to be able to call upon your name and to know that you hear us when we pray. Lord, for those that raise their hand and say, hey, I I know I'm not where I need to be. Lord, wrap your arms around them. Remind them of how much you love them. Lord, for the individual who raised their hand and said, hey, you know what? Today, I'm now following Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. Lord, I pray this would be a moment that they would never forget and that Red Tree would come alongside them and be able to help them to understand what it is to follow after you. Help us to constantly be people who say yes, Help us to be people who are obedient and will continue to submit and surrender to your Lordship. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for what it is that you're doing. And God, we're excited about what it is you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. We just wanted to give a huge thank you to those of you that already partner with us through giving. And we've got multiple resources for you to utilize from to do that. You can give online, you can text the number 84321, or you can download our Church Center app. Again, thank you so much for listening today, and we'll see you next time.